Hello, and welcome to the Better Than I Found It podcast. I'm your host, Mike McGraw. Today's guest is one of the really great young emerging stars on the PGA Tour, Maverick McNeely. I love Maverick's story, going from true walk-on to college player of the year, and he did it in just a little over 18 months. He highlights his first love of hockey, as well as his decision to give that up and take up competitive golf seriously. Maverick talks about it, the ways any player can improve, but specifically for him, he describes the value of journaling and how it's benefited his development as a player. For anyone wanting to play college golf, he also talks about the amazing lessons he learned from upperclassmen during his freshman year, two great upperclassmen, and how those lessons had transformed him as a player. There's so many great learning nuggets in this episode, so I ask you to pay close attention. Without further ado, let's get right to the talk with Maverick McNeely. Good morning, Maverick. How are you doing today? Good, Coach. How are you? I'm doing great. Just kind of chilly here in Waco. First little cool spell we've had. It's raining. Not, not that good. So uh, pretty nice weather in Las Vegas. It's all right. It's pretty good for this time of year. It's uh, low 60s, sunny, not too windy. You know, it's uh, it's pretty good here in Vegas all year unless you get those windy days. Yeah, I remember some windy days playing in the Southern Highlands Collegiate. Yeah. <laughs> that thing got yeah. pretty hair-raising at times. But, well, I want to say begin by just saying thanks for coming on the podcast today. Um, you know, obviously, you and I have known each other quite a while, and your little brother's playing on my golf team right now. So um, there was a connection there for sure. But um, I, I just want to say, say thanks. You know, you've got a little bit of downtime here, so it's a good time to do it. Yes, it's, it's great. It's, uh, it's fun watching him play. I've, you know, the, the four of us, uh, there's four brothers. I don't know how my mom did it growing up, but, uh, you know, we all play golf. We all love to play, and that's, uh, that's what we're going to be doing all winter vacation together. I love it. That's great. Are, are you heading down to Palm Springs at some point, too? I am. That's uh, it's a quick four and a half hour drive from Vegas. Really nice and easy. And uh, I'm actually really excited. I don't have to get on an airplane for a couple months. I'm going to be starting the season in Palm Springs at the American Express. I'll be skipping Sony again this year. Um, so I'll just drive Vegas to Palm Springs, drive over the hill to Torrey and then back to Vegas, uh, skip Phoenix and then uh, hop on a plane for the first time in a while to Pebble and Riv. So it sounds like to me, you've already got a good, a good plan. We'll talk a little bit more about your you know, upcoming season a little later, but so let's, let's talk briefly. Uh, you are a PGA tour player an established PGA tour player now, but it, it really didn't look like you were going to be a PGA tour player when you're a young boy growing up. Uh, you have a very unusual path to the PGA tour. You were literally a, an ice hockey player. Can you describe that and who got you started in that and all of that? Yeah, again, it's a family thing. My three brothers and I all played ice hockey. My dad grew up in Michigan and played for his high school team. And uh, he played until he was 50 and broke his leg. But uh, I learned how to skate at a young age. I joked in high school I could skate better than I could walk. And um, I just I played hockey seven months of the year and, and golf for the five warm months. And then um, the only time our family would really go play is in Palm Springs over Thanksgiving, Christmas, and spring breaks, we would play 36 a day on average. Uh, I've done 72 holes in a day on several occasions with my dad and brothers. and There's a little bit of running involved, but, you know, I, I just played a lot of sports growing up, played soccer, basketball. I swam uh, just a lot of, you know, a little bit of tennis and kind of narrowed down to golf and hockey in high school. And I was playing with the idea of trying to go somewhere on the East Coast and play Division Three golf and hockey and see if those seasons would line up. But then uh, my junior year, late my junior year in college, it started to seem like it would actually be a possibility to go to my dream school, Stanford, and play for Coach Ray. And uh, that was when I decided that uh, you know, those, those hockey players are all pretty big and 155 pounds soaking wet wasn't going to be the, the right decision for me. And uh, I had a chance to go play golf at Stanford and, and uh, that's well, exactly what I wanted to do. That's interesting. You should say that I was at the U S junior the summer of 2012, just looking for players. I was at Oklahoma state head coach at the time. And I happened upon you. I didn't know who you were. And I don't even think there was a sign behind your golf bag telling <laughs> me who you were. So I was just watching you hit balls and I was pretty impressed. And so I just stood there and watched for maybe 10 minutes and Conrad Ray walked up. 
And I said, have you seen this kid? And he goes, yeah, he's, he's going to walk on at Stanford next year. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, so you've seen him. <laughs> well, at <laughs> least I knew a, a good player when I saw him. You, you made it to the quarterfinals that week in the U.S. Junior. That was kind I of your did. big I, breakout in national tournaments, wasn't it? it? It was. I think I was down in every single one of my matches with three or four holes to play. And uh, I was four down through eight in that quarterfinal match. And I lost in extra holes. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, you know, just playing against big names. I just go, man, if I, uh, if I win this quarterfinal match, I'll get to play against Jim Liu, who was the, the greatest junior golfer of all time and ended up being in my class at Stanford, which is pretty cool. And, um, but yeah, I had no expectations, had my uncle caddying that week and just had a lot of fun. I, you know, it's, it was, uh, it was a little eye opening for me. That's great. Yeah. I, uh, I know that a young man like you, you really at, it was what at what point did you decide you were actually going to play college golf over hockey? I mean, at what point did that flip? Um, I, I, I realized I was going to focus on golf when coach Ray told me that there would be a spot for me on the Stanford team. If I got into the school and uh, it was my dream school, I grew up playing the Stanford golf course and practicing with the guys on the team. And uh, it, I, I was, it's a funny story. I was practicing at the range and Rob Gruby, I, this had to have been, I don't know, 20, 2008, 2009, something like that. And he was walking over to the trash bin to throw away his last year's golf bag, this pink faded, uh, it, was, it was just old Stanford bag. And uh, my dad said, Hey, Rob, are you going to throw that out? And he said, yeah, I am. And he was all American at the time. And uh, he said, well, can Mav have it? And he said, Oh yeah, sure. So, uh, <laughs> I, I repped the, uh, this pink faded gross looking Stanford golf bag with uh, Rob Gruby's name on it for at least a year and a half. And I, I didn't mind people calling me Rob on the first tee and all that stuff, but it was, it was fun. And I, I had a, 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 again, faded red Stanford hat that I still have that coach Ray gave me his first year on the job. Wow. It's been a long time ago. Um, and I think I had it signed by Rob Gruby and Joseph Bramlett, who I'm actually uh, living with now. He's living with me here in Vegas and he's on the PGA tour. We had two years on the corn ferry together and, and got to the PGA tour last year. So uh, kind of small world, but to answer your question, I, uh, I focused on golf when I thought I had a spot on the team and, and that was, uh, it was a dream come true. Almost like flipping the switch, if you will. Pretty much. Yeah. And uh, I remember my first year at Stanford was the first time I had played golf all year round. It was uh, I remember Cameron Wilson walking up to me, just I think he was getting some stuff out of his locker in the off season after the fall season. And I was practicing. I was the only guy there. He goes, Mav, are you going to take a day off? And I go, I don't want to. I just want to <laughs> practice. And I, I, I went a year and a half where I play golf every single day. I didn't miss a day touching a club and uh, I think that was a huge part of why I improved so quickly and uh, um, just I was so fresh and so excited and just couldn't couldn't wait to keep playing. Yeah before we get to the rest of that Stanford career which I've got some statistics I want to throw out the uh, the interaction between you and Dakota and Colt and Scout had to have been Pretty incredible. And I know the story is out there that you guys shared a room together growing up. So you, yep. your dad and mom had you living in the same room. Well, there's a lot of competitiveness there. And then you all were good athletes. So you all played a lot of sports. Talk, talk about how that shaped you as a competitor and, and eventually as a golfer. Well, I think uh, my relationship with my brother shaped me as a person more than anything. Uh, like you said, we have four twin beds lined up in our room. Uh, no phones, no electronics allowed. And my whole life, I wanted to have my own room, my own space. And it wasn't until my sophomore year of college that I actually had my own, you know, 150 square foot room, which was the coolest thing ever. But that's part of the reason my brothers and I are so close. And uh, I don't think any of us would do it over again. And when we go to Palm Springs, we all sleep in the same room again. And uh, it's just like old times, a lot of body noises, a lot of snoring. And uh, it's, we, we just have a great time, but we all, you know, golf for us is a family thing. So is hockey. Um, we go shoot pucks together. Dakota would play goalie sometimes. And same thing, chipping contests. I, I still hold it over Scouty's head that 
he went 12 years of his life and never beat me in a putting contest. And I still remember the look on his face when he finally beat me. He was so happy because I just, <laughs> I just kept letting him know, Scotty, you've never beaten me in a putting contest. Um, and then we also have these games, our favorite game to play at our home course, because we play a lot faster than the average, uh, average country clubber. Uh, well, the six of us can play in under four hours, mom, dad, and the four of us. And so we'll play six golf balls, two points a hole. Me and Scott, it was me and Scott against Dakota and Colt growing up. And there would be one point for the best ball score and one point for an alternate shot ball. So every other hole you'd be playing two tee shots. And so I remember uh, Dakota Scout and I were putting out on the second green at Sharon Heights. Third hole is a dog leg, shark dog leg left, Redwoods down the left, OB down the right. And we hear this whack crunch as Colty drills it into the trees just off the tee box. And he yells over, don't worry, that was my ball, like the, the best ball. And then uh, Scouty makes his putt and I'm lining up mine to hear another whack and another crunch even closer to the tee box. And Dakota just goes, oh boy, <laughs> punching out on the next. So, But that, that's how it was. And we, you know, it's so much fun having some, uh, some brothers to practice and play with. So over the Christmas break, you guys will have some matches again then. Oh, for sure. We, uh, we love to play for push-ups in front of the clubhouse. Oh, that's, that's, in, that's embarrassing if you lose that mm -hmm. contest. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. Well, um, so you talked about your freshman year, and you just were playing a ton of golf, and more golf than you'd ever played. But I remember being at the national championship at Prairie Dunes, and I was walking with Trey Mullinex the first two rounds from Alabama, mm -hmm. and you were paired with Trey. And mm -hmm. I remember that I had, I had seen you, but I had never really talked to you or met you. And I was amazed at a couple of things. One, that you were their five man. I thought, how, how in the world is this guy five man? There's no way. And mm -hmm. number two is you were a very mature young freshman. You know, you were very mature. And so uh, you remember that week at Prairie Dunes pretty well? I do. I do. I remember it was a good 69 in that second round after a, you know, so, so first round. Yeah. Yeah. You, you and I talked a lot. And one of the things I discovered from those uh, conversations we had was that you, uh, you love to journal, you love to uh, write down things. So I'm, I want to get to that in just a bit. If mm -hmm. so, don't let me forget that uh, because I'm a journaler. I love to journal. I love to write things down. I love to keep track of what's happening and learn from what I'm doing. But, but before we get through, so that was your freshman year and, and you all lost Oklahoma state in the semifinals. We did. And uh, you had a match against Taylor Gooch that went to the 21st hole. As I recall, that was an amazing match. Yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, I, I honestly felt like I was going to win that match the whole time. <laughs> yeah. It looked but, like it. Uh, when we were watching. He made a great putt on the third playoff hole and, I actually hit an incredible shot out of the left rough on 11. I thought I was going to win 11 with a two putt par, but he, uh, he hit it way left and, and hit this. It must've been a really good long iron out of that left rough to the front edge. And I got, oh, well, I guess we're still going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was quite a match. So let, let's just briefly go over, and it's pretty hard to be brief about this because there were so many accomplishments. Your career at Stanford is one of the greatest in the history of that program. And that's that school. And that's a storied, tradition with a lot of great players, um, including Tiger Woods and, and uh, Tom Watson and Patrick Rogers and several others. But you were a uh, two-time Palmer Cupper, 2015 and 2017, two-time Walker Cupper, 2015 and 2017. You represented the United States in the Eisenhower Trophy, which is the world amateur in 2016. You were a three-time first-team All-American you won the Fred Haskins Award for Player of the Year in 2015 and the Jack Nicholas Award, another Player of the Year Award that year. In 2017, you won the Ben Hogan Award, which combines amateur golf and college golf accomplishments. And then you won that same year what I consider to be the most impressive award in all of college golf, and that is the Byron Nelson Award, which they give it to a person who's also a, not just a good player, but a great, great student. And so all of those awards came out of that, plus 11 wins, which tied Tiger Woods and Patrick Rogers for most wins. I mean, that, that's a pretty incredible career. I mean, you, it's like if a, coach, if, a, if a coach had a first team AJJL American, best player in the country, number one player, he couldn't imagine a player with that resume as a junior golfer even accomplishing what you did. So without 
stroking your ego too much. I, I, I want to uh, I want to point those statistics out, and then I'm going to quote you because you you said this, and I included this in my book about what Conrad Ray had told you one time, and he said he told you he said Conrad I'm quoting you Conrad Ray once told me that being a part of the Stanford golf program is like a slow moving train. You get on for four years and then you get off. You only have that amount of time to make your mark. Uh, and that's what he told you. And so I guess you took him seriously. <laughs> you, yeah. you got a lot done during that time. But so I'm just, uh, I'm amazed when I look back at this record about what you were, and I was coaching college golf the whole time. Pretty amazing. Did, did, could you have imagined that going in? Uh to answer that question, I'll just tell you my goal for my freshman year was to qualify for two events, and that would have been a success for me. Okay. <laughs> so you kind of outshot what you were thinking you might do there, didn't you? A little bit, yeah, I did. Um, I, you know, that, that freshman fall was big for me. I didn't qualify for Olympia Fields, the first event of the year. Uh, Cameron Wilson won that. And then I – actually, there were two really big turning points in my freshman year that I think – um, started a bit of that, that trajectory for me. The first was, um, the, the second qualifying my freshman year, I, uh, actually won qualifying. It was a, a, a six round rolling, uh, scoring total. And I, uh, just played really nicely. I remember I hit it unbelievably well. I think I hit 18 net 20 greens, which means I hit two par fives under regulation, uh, at, TPC Harding Park. Actually, you know, it was 21 greens. It was net 21 greens. Wow. I shot four under uh, 35 putts, but uh, that, I was just hitting the ball really, really well, really solidly. Uh, I think a lot of that was in part due to um, some of Cameron and Patrick's coaching and, and just watching them and what they did, because I'd never really been exposed to these world-class players in the way that I was at that point. Um, Cameron taught me and Patrick taught me the track man ball flight laws, how ball starts with club face and, uh, the path creates spin and shape, uh, how center hits on the driver and off center hits create gear effect and how that affects ball flight. And I started watching my golf balls with a lot more interest and, and knowledge and started to figure out. Um, how to control the golf ball and ball flight a lot better. And I, I wrote, I remember writing down after one tournament um, is that I want to have contact and sound like Cameron Wilson, and I want to be able to control the flight and trajectory like Patrick. And so I worked really hard on that. And that was so eye opening and groundbreaking for me because I'd never thought about that. I was just a, a hockey player that would swing hard and hoped I found it. And then I started to control it and, and uh, hit it really nicely and really solid that fall. So that was a big confidence boost to play. Uh, I played Aaron Hills was my first ever college event. And I also played the golf club of Georgia where I didn't play very well, but uh, I got, got a couple events under my belt in the fall season. Uh, had that winter break where I played golf every single day and then came back out, qualified for Hawaii, um, played all right. Uh, Bermuda grass, again, was a huge learning curve for me. I, I had never really played on Bermuda grass in my life. And it was, a, it was a complete mystery to me how a ball could break, not where the slope was telling it to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and how never, to chip into the grain. You never experienced grain, had you? I had never experienced grain. I had never experienced a Bermuda rough flyer. Um, it was, it was eye-opening, to say the least. But uh, the, I, I um, was tied for the lead with Patrick Rogers and I was in second place then going into the final round of Palm Springs. And I shot, I think I want to say I shot 82 in the final round. Um, and then had to go for a, a three freshman for two spots qualifying for Las Vegas. And uh, I'm going down a rabbit hole here, but there's a point to the story um, because I, I went from being a good round away from maybe winning my first college event to shooting the worst round of the year on the team. And now I'm in a three freshman for two spots qualifier for the Southern Highlands event in Vegas. Uh, Jim and Virat were two of the best recruits 
in the world coming into the team and they just they fleeced me in that qualifier and I didn't get to go to Las Vegas and our next tournament was our home tournament at Stanford and I sent coach texts every single day I played Stanford every single day leading up to that tournament while the team was away five days five rounds I shot in the 60s every single day told him the drills I was doing and uh, he gave me the five spot at uh, the Goodwin and I finished fourth there finished ninth at Pasa Tiempo and uh, and I think I've or no finished fourth at the Goodwin sixth at Pasa Tiempo ninth at Pac-12s and that's how I uh, earned a spot at regionals and nationals but for me it was such a kick in the pants to not get to play it killed me to not be on that starting team and once I had a little taste of it and and felt what it was like to be out there and love playing and love competing. I, I couldn't stand to sit at home and, and watch those guys out there playing and not be doing something. So uh, that was a, a big kickstart for me to, to just get in gear and start playing hard. Pretty, pretty good turning point in a young man's career for sure. And, but you earned the spot and then mm -hmm. you, you came in. What, what strikes me about this story that you tell is you, you've mentioned other players in the team so coaches, we always feel like we're going to do all the coaching. And I think that that's, that's the beauty of college golf. And the, the benefit that you get from being on a team is here you were a freshman. You didn't know, come here from Sikkim. You were just a, <laughs> a kid who swung hard with a golf club in your hand. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you had two very seasoned veterans, very, very knowledgeable about the game and very uh, much thinkers and workers and they paid attention to detail like nobody's business. That's why they were first team all Americans, but yes. you learn from them. And I think kids miss that. They, especially mm -hmm. young ones, they miss it because they're so upset about not being on the travel squad. They forget, well, if I'm going to get there, I've got to figure out how to beat these guys. So yeah. you did a great job of learning from your teammates, which I wish more guys did. I think that's a valuable thing in college golf. So, yeah, I, uh, Actually, the journaling that we talked about came from Patrick and Cameron. Uh, Patrick was very stats oriented. He wrote down a journal with all of his tournament stats and uh, was a lot more numbers oriented. And Cameron wrote more of a diary every single day after every practice. He just wrote down what he did and how it went. Um, I kind of combined those two approaches and we can talk about this more. But uh, another, uh, you know, player that I have to give a lot of credit to is my uh, roommate and one of my best friends in the world Virat Badwar was also in the, my year he was the 11th ranked amateur in the world starting at Stanford not just junior 11th ranked amateur and uh, he was one of the best putters I'd ever seen and I was one of the worst putters you've ever seen I lost on average three strokes per round. I calculated my strokes gained. I, I averaged minus three on that 82. I shot at Palm Springs. I lost seven and a half strokes putting. That's mm -hmm. really bad, but you couldn't put that bad left-handed with your eyes closed. <laughs> um, and I went my entire freshman year and never beat Verat in a putting contest. And um, the difference between my freshman year and my sophomore year was literally just three strokes on the greens per round, nine shots a tournament. And that's the difference between, being a freshman that's not really making the lineup to having the best year of golf results wise in my life uh, in 2015. I won seven out of 12 tournaments in 2015 and I just felt like I could do no wrong. And that's, that's why, and that is when I realized I would always rather be the worst player on the best team than the best player on the worst team, because you can learn from people and just whether it's through osmosis or watching what they did or just competing you know, I learned so much from Patrick and Cameron about their processes. Um, David Boot, his short game, Farad Badwar, uh, incredible putter. And, um, you know, I, I went in with the attitude that everyone on this team probably does something better than me. And if I figure out what that is and I work on it and try and copy them and learn from them, I'll be a better player. That you just literally spelled out the textbook for me to give to every incoming freshman of how you <laughs> to take care of your business your freshman year. You've that is it right there. You have to be willing to, not willing, eager. You've got to be excited about learning from people who have already been in your shoes and they're obviously having great results. I, that right there is just phenomenal. But what strikes me is that we were going to talk about journaling is you combine two guys' journals together. One mm -hmm. who was very, very numbers oriented and one who was 
situation story oriented and you put them together is that sort of still the way you do journaling today it is but actually the the reason my journaling started was i was so excited to be on the stanford golf team i thought this was going to be the coolest thing and i just wanted to have a record of everything i did so that when i look back in 20 30 years i go man I, these are my four years on the stanford golf team so i remember writing down with the first qualifying round I shot 71 at stanford fun story i walked out of ariaga i was so nervous uh, we had we had three days on campus before school started and I walked out of Arriaga dining and tried to force down one last pancake because I was pretty nervous. Got through the double doors and just didn't feel good. Made a beeline for the trash can and, and put all my <laughs> breakfast back there. And uh, I remember I turned around and look and V was standing at me with huge eyes going, dude, are you okay? <laughs> I'm fine. I feel better now. Uh, I shot 71. Uh, I still remember, you know, I, I said I hit it really badly. The first six holes wasn't feeling good, but then I squared up my shoulders and hit it great on the back nine. And um, it's just little things like that. And then I did that for every single round. And uh, uh, I started to see patterns. I started to realize the uh, utility of going back and finding what fuels were useful for me because you can't possibly remember everything. Even this past week in Mayakoba, I was having so much trouble out of this past Palom rough. It's an inch, inch and a half of this really thick bladed rough, but I was hitting half of my chips three feet out of, out of the rock. I couldn't get it on the green. And, uh, and then Travis, my caddy said, didn't you figure something out last year? I remember we spent an hour and a half on the chipping green. And uh, I went back in my notes, sure enough, handle down, handle forward, use the full length of the toe and chop um, started doing that and made it a lot easier. So uh, I still find a lot of use for it. Every time I work with Butch or my, one of my coaches, I write down what I was doing, what I was working on. Um, but it, the, the journaling started out as something just to remember what I did kind of nostalgic. And it, I realized pretty quickly the, how useful it was as a tool. And uh, I used to write down every single shot of and I did in college every single shot I hit but now that I'm playing 30 events a year I don't literally I literally don't have the time to write down a hundred rounds worth of shots with travel and practice and everything so I, I do that in my pin sheet now I, on the court call on my pin sheet I write down uh everything I need to remember the shot I hit so if I go back and five years from now look at my my Akoba pin sheets, I'll remember the shots I hit, how I hit it, what the wind condition was. And I'll be able to play that hole again in my head. Cause I can't, I'm not Tiger Woods. I can't keep every single shot I've ever hit in my head um, on repeat. But, uh, and then I go on uh, my computer and I write down my stats for the day, uh, which I easy to pull off the app online. Uh, if you don't have an app, fairways, greens, putts, and then, um, a stat that I keep that I think every player at every level should keep are strikes. And there's three kinds of strikes. There's a three putt, a two chip. So anything inside 50 yards that you don't get on the green and a penalty shot. And you go, why should a, you're probably thinking, why does a pro need to keep this stat? You know, what, what, shouldn't you, you know, avoid those at all? You know, it, those aren't hard to avoid. I find that if I'm in a tournament and I have four strikes or less, I'll probably be in the top 10. Uh, I finished 12th at Mayakoba. I had five strikes mm. and uh, one, one strike shot out away. of the top 10, one yeah. strike away. And, you know, every strike you're basically throwing away three quarters to a full shot. And uh, I had no strikes on the weekend, shot 63, 66, and went from making the cut on the number to 12th. And, you know, what? even if you're a hacker that's shooting 85, 90, if you can get the ball on the green, around the greens, not even close, avoid three putts and get the ball in play. Um, you're going to save a lot of shots. So I keep that stat and I've been keeping that one for a while. And it's a very, very important stat for me. Um, even more so than strokes gained. And then, uh, and then I just write down, you know, how things went for the day. What, what was I, how was my warm up? Um, did I have any swing keys, any important moments in the round? Uh, how was I feeling? Was my body okay? Just literally anything that comes to my mind that I think might be important or useful. It's, no more than a paragraph. I usually do it right before I go to bed. Just think about the day on, on the whole. And then I forget about it and go to the next day. And uh, at the end of the week, I just load my note onto my Google or onto my uh, Word doc for the year and just keep going. 
you know, you, you mentioned that you uh, discovered by looking at the year before notes you had taken about chipping out of that rough. Mm -hmm. It was so difficult. I've always told kids when I'm telling them about journaling and why it's important, you mm -hmm. have, to, it's good when you refer back to it because it brings something back to the moment. It gives you that moment. Yep. Plus six months from now, you might be in a low spot. You might be in a kind of a doldrums, not playing well, kind of searching, trying to figure something out. Instead of just trying to ask a thousand questions of a hundred different people, you can go back to your own words that you've written that worked for you. And mm -hmm. there's all kinds of solutions for Maverick McNeely that you've already written down that you've got. This is a database of information that helps you play better. It's, it's amazing. And, and even if you don't go back to it, just the exercise of thinking for five minutes at the end of the day, what happened today and, and answering the question, why did it happen the way it did? Um, that I think is 90% of the use of it. If you just, if you had a really bad day or a really good day, or even just an average day, um, understanding what it is that makes you play well and make you play poorly. And just taking a couple minutes to think about it, uh, is, is really, really valuable, even more so than going back and looking at it later. Well, thank you for that. That's, I want that message out there to as many young players as, as can get it. It does take extra effort. It does take a little bit of time and it, it does take discipline, but if you want to be great, you're going to have to be disciplined anyway. So it's five, five minutes a day. Just, yeah. just have a note on your phone and just every tournament, write down the name of the tournament, where it was, what date it was, um, where you finished. And then I have a Monday little paragraph, Tuesday, little paragraph, Wednesday, little paragraph, round one, two, three, and four. And it, like I said, it takes five minutes before bed. It's, it's really not that much effort. Yeah. And then you've got a record of that tournament. And, you know, and as I said, you said, Hey, you're going through the exercise of going through the introspection and looking back and how did it happen? Why did it happen? But you also have a record of something that a year from now you can look back and say, mm -hmm. why did I play well there? Okay. And I just read right through. Oh, wow. That's good. So and I'm very impressed bad, by that. Go ahead. Yeah. And even if it's a bad day, it kind of helps me put it to rest. Um, I just write down what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling. And then when I turn the phone off and roll over, it's, it's done. It's over. It's, it's well focusing on, uh, I look down on my schedule, 6, 6 a.m. wake up, 6.55 out the door. That's, that's all I'm thinking about. It's, it's that's great. Next day. So you just got back from your last tournament of the calendar year. You're going to play, you said you're going to pick it up again at uh, what tournament is your first tournament? At American Express, Palm Springs. Yeah, Palm Springs. So that'll be your next event. So in between then and now, you obviously are going to have some vacation time, family time, work obviously on your game. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about your schedule coming up for next year. But I want to ask you a question. So you've been out there playing pro golf since 2017. At some point, mm -hmm. you turned pro after the Walker Cup. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, yeah, first event was Safeway in 2017. Okay. So you've been out there a little over three years. Uh, describe the greatest lessons that you've learned because, and I'm going to ask you this too. You said you learned a lot from your teammates mm -hmm. when you were a freshman at Stanford. Uh, obviously there's a lot of learning curve to playing the PGA tour or even the corn Ferry tour, or even a mini tour. There's a learning mm -hmm. curve. So what do you think some of the greatest lessons are you've learned and have you reached out to other players on the tour? Um, I, uh, I think a lot of the things I've learned, I've, I've kind of had to learn as I went, uh, not really from other players. I'd say the biggest difference when people ask me from college golf to professional golf, is just the volume of golf you play. I played 30 events, my first two seasons as a professional four day, four round events, seven days traveling across the country. It's very different than a 14 year, 14 week a year college event where you have a one practice round and three uh, tournament days because you come home and you get to work out for two weeks. You get to practice and qualify with the team. I played six or seven events in a row and it's, you don't have the time and the energy to hit the amount of golf balls that you do in college and practice and spend the time on your short game. And um, you know, you, you, people like players think that when they turn pro, they're going to have a lot of time because they're not going to have to spend it on school and studying. Well, you can, 
cut out the school and studying, but now you got real life. You've got bills to pay. You've got, you know, your car is going to break down. You got to rent an apartment. You got to, uh, you got to take care of your own life, do laundry. You know, it's, it's, this stuff adds up and it's like a full-time job on top of a job. Just, you know, you don't realize how much your mom does for you is, is basically what I'm saying. So when you turn pro, it's not like you're going to get more time. You have to get more efficient with your time and you have to figure out um, the bare bones of what you need to do to play well any given week and make sure you hammer those home. Um, and for me, the three things I know I need to do every week are speed control with putting. I need to get a feel for short game conditions on the golf course, and I need to work on distance control from 75 to 175. Okay. If I do those three things, I feel like I'm prepared to play no matter what. Um, I can do those around a pro-am and a practice round and a travel day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and I can be ready to go on Thursday. And that took me a long time to get there because I spent a lot of weeks, my first two years, going, man, I didn't have the time to hit the balls, the balls I need. I'm not swinging it very well. My putting doesn't feel good. Um, completely skip short games some weeks and get out there and have no idea how to play shots out of the, you know, it's just a mess. And, and then on top of that, I'm tired. I'm walking, you know, 50 miles a week. It's a very different strain and stress on your body. And then you realize you're not working out and you're not as strong. You're trying to you know, keep nagging injuries at bay. It becomes a lot. So you really, and, and in college, you almost have a luxury that you have structured practice time. You can spend an extra hour and a half, two hours hitting balls and just hitting eight irons if you want. You can go and, and just screw around with teammates and have, uh, you know, games and stuff. And that's all great for development. But to be ready to play professional golf, you have to have an idea of what you need to do to play well any given week and, uh, and really be disciplined to do that and then feel like you're ready to go. Um, second lesson I learned was just from watching guys and I learned it more. So my first year on the PGA tour is in college, it felt like there was a lot of emphasis on your weaknesses. You got to build up your weaknesses. You got to fill in holes in your game. If your short game's not good, you got to spend hours on your short game every day. Um, I don't really see that on the PGA tour. I actually see the opposite on the PGA tour. Everyone who has a tee time, is really, really good at something. Uh, Scott Piercy is an extreme example. He goes, I'm never going to be a good putter. And I'm not, I'm not advocating this. I'm just using it to prove a point. But he knows that he can compete and he can win on his iron game alone. And so every week he's out practicing at, at Summerlin, he's hitting irons. He's working on distance control. And he's one of the best iron players on the planet because he knows that's how he's going to make money. That's how he's going to keep his card. And my basically the lesson I learned was not to neglect your strengths. If I show up with my strengths every week, I'll be able to compete. If my putting speed is good, if I can, if I can chip it inside eight feet and if my putting feel is good, I'm going to be fine. Even if I hit it horrible, I'll be able to get up and down and salvage. I'll be able to score on the par fives. If I hit it good, if my wedge numbers are dialed, it's going to be great. I'll play really well. I have a chance to win. I'll get my driver in play, but and that doesn't mean I'm not out, out there trying to work on my iron game and trying to hit it a little further and, and improve things. But week in and week out, I need to have my big guns with me. And that's what I see from the best players in the world. And the players who've been on tour for a long time is they make sure that what they do well, they have every week. And, uh, and then the third thing I'd say is I played a practice round at CJ Cup with Rory and got to play 18 holes with him. And I asked him, you know, a lot of times people ask players, what do you wish you had done? But Rory's done pretty well. So I asked him, what did you do as a young player that helped you? That, what, what do you pat yourself on the back for, you know, in your first couple of years on tour? And he said two things. One is he learned how to play a lot more shots um, on the PA, PGA Tour around the greens, short game shots. There's different lies more extreme lies and learning how to play shots differently and have a greater variety. And that's a great thing about short game is everyone does it differently. There's no right or wrong way to do it. Really. Um, there's just a lot of different ways to approach different shots. He said the second one was playing more practice rounds with veteran players and, and uh, just talking to them and learning from them. And that's something that I want to do more of this year. Now that I've seen most of the golf courses on my schedule and, uh, 
I'm, I'm going to see if I can learn a little more from other players going forward. So the model that you created basically at Stanford, where you look to Cameron and look to Patrick and look to David, look to just all sorts of great players. You're going to sort of mm -hmm. kind of replicate that on the tour where you actually look and learn and observe from players. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's for sure. I remember walking down the range at Napa last year um, and I saw Corey Connors just hitting balls and I went, wow, that he looks like he's hitting it good. And then I was paired with him on Sunday and he shot 64 backdoor top 10 hitting 18 greens. And I went, he's hitting it pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so there's just stuff like that all over. Smaller. Exactly. Exactly. So, I, I mean, there's just examples of, of that everywhere in college, but um, you know, if you're, if you're the number five player, learn from the number ones, one, two, three, four, and even the, the other guys on your team, you know, who are, who are good at things. And if you're a number one player, um, you're probably going to be paired with other number ones from other schools. Watch what they do and, and, and try and pick up little things here and there. You know, on that note, when you were a senior at Stanford, we were playing a tournament in Cabo and you were there and uh, your opening round, I believe, was 75. Mm -hmm. And uh, I told my assistant coach, Ryan Blagg, I said, he said, boy, Maverick didn't play well today. I said, no, but I bet he doesn't shoot above 65 tomorrow. And I, I truly said that. And you shot 65 the next mm -hmm. day. Well, one of my players on my team was a junior college transfer named Hunter Shattuck. Mm -hmm. And Hunter, with him. yeah. And Hunter, you know, in that, that tournament, you have foursomes going off with in two carts to, to be able to walk. You can't walk that golf course. And mm -hmm. I noticed you had put your golf bag on a cart over there. And I knew that uh, Hunter was playing with you. And I said, Hunter, put your clubs on that cart right now. And he goes, what are you talking about? And I said, just do it. And um, so he put his clubs on your cart. And I said, Hunter, uh, what you need to do today is you don't need to ask any questions or whatever. Just watch what he does this week. Just watch what he does today. And I don't know what you shot that. I don't actually know what you shot the final round, but it was, I think you birdied the last three holes maybe, or three mm -hmm. of the last four yeah. and shot maybe three under. But Hunter came out of that with a whole new perspective on what a good player looked like and how he handled it. And there was one shot that you showed him on number 18 off the tee, and you called it oh, your yeah, seed, the seed ball. Yeah, yeah. T tell, us, uh, tell us about that ball, because Hunter was shocked. He'd never seen anything like it. That's, uh, I, I got to give Cameron Wilson the credit for that one. He used that to win the national championship at Prairie Dunes. Um, it's a, it's a pretty easy shot to learn. Um, I've got a couple of, I mean, it, it's basically just hitting it super low with the driver. Um, I use, a, I call it the seedling. It's, it's not quite as much of a seed. I, I use, that's part of the reason I think I've had a lot of success at Mayakoba because you just got to get it and play 265 wet, wet ground and just kind of knock it down. But uh, the Cameron Wilson playbook, tee it down a little lower, ball back in the stance and aim a little bit left to offset the the uh, angle of attack you're going to have on your driver and the right path that creates. And uh, I learned it by sticking a tee in the ground, uh, all the way down in the ground, a foot in front of the ball and just trying to hit, you know, tee that ball low and hit the ball into the tee that's a foot in front and just using that as a visual. And that brought the ball flight down. And it's a shot I use in a lot of scenarios. I use that shot um, to great effect at the 20. 20 man get 2015 pac 12s at palouse ridge it was blowing 2030 and every fairway was like a half pipe i just aimed it at the the bottom of the, the half pipe and i never hit it above the the left boundary and or right boundary or whatever it was got every ball in play and uh one one by a good margin that week so uh, it's a very useful shot it's it's my teddy bear shot off the tee and uh it's it's not that hard to learn. Just it's visual. Just stick a tee in the ground and try and smash the ball into the tee. I remember Hunter asked me, he said, I, I can't, I've got to, I've got to find out about this shot. And you called it your seedling, your seed, you called it the seed shot. I think. Seed, seed ball. Yeah. That's seed Cameron ball. Wilson's lingo. <laughs> yeah. Really, really well done. But, but again, an example of a player learning from another player. And I think that's an undervalued thing in college golf is what you have on your team the greatest resource I can give a player is not a new facility. It's not uh, flying a different way. It's not better golf clubs and 
the greatest resource I can give a player is better teammates. The mm -hmm. greatest resource I can give them is some, uh, somebody you can learn from. And I think that gets missed on a lot of players. And you didn't, it didn't, um, you didn't miss it. You learned from it, which is great. I was, I was just excited. I, I walked into my freshman year going, this is the best team in college golf. And uh, I was just going to try and learn from these guys and, and play as many tournaments as possible. That was my, uh, that was my attitude. And, and I, you know, coach Ray, coach Rowe and the guys I'm very fortunate were so, uh, so open and welcoming to me and, and wanted to teach me as much as they could too. Well, um, let's talk about a couple other things as you've become a professional. Uh, you, you've talked about how you prepare each week, how it's different than college was a lot of differences there. One of the things that you've created is, uh, a nonprofit called Birdies for Education. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because it impresses me a lot that you would want to give back. And you did this when you were still on the Corn Ferry Tour, I believe. So talk about that Birdies for correct. Education. Um, I started Birdies for Education actually at the lowest point of my career to date. Um, I just missed a lot of cuts out of a lot. And I, I was really struggling and basically wanted a you know, something to feel good about, something that I was really excited about in golf in my career. And I've been, uh, Birdies for Education benefits Curriki, which is an education nonprofit, started out as online K through 12 free open source learning resources, uh, everything from textbooks, workbooks, projects, worksheets, uh, completely open and free. We have 250,000 available online that anyone can use. Um, and recently Curriki has, created this thing called Curriki Studio, which if you, you know, PowerPoint is to presentations as Curriki Studio is to really engaging online learning uh, resources. So not just watching a lecture, but interacting with it, uh, quizzes, exams, real time scoring it. So we created a really easy to use tool that can help uh, teachers, administrators, even parents create uh, learning assets that you can learn from really quickly and, and uh, make it about whatever you want. So I've always been a huge fan of Cricky and, and wanted to help out as much as I could being fortunate going to the Harker School in Stanford and, and knowing the opportunities that a uh, good education can give you. And um, I started Birdies for Education and said, I'm going to pledge $10 for every birdie I make this year to Cricky uh, in the 2018 season. And uh, sorry, in the 2019 season was my first year. Uh, no, no, it was the, I'm, I'm losing track. It was the, the 2019 season was my first year with Birdies for Education. And uh, I raised a couple hundred thousand dollars, got some people signed up. You can sign up at birdiesforeducation.com uh, and pledge birdies or pledge a certain amount of money per birdies. Um, a bunch of my sponsors, KPMG, Callaway, Under Armour have been really generous and helped out. And um, it, it's just been fun for me to feel like I'm playing for something more. Uh, and uh, we've, we've, re we've raised about half a million dollars so far in three years. So it's been a lot of fun. That's great. That is really, really fantastic. And you got your degree at Stanford. Tell me what that was in again. It was management science and engineering. Uh, it's basically industrial engineering or it felt like I took the core of a bunch of different majors uh, all geared towards different ways to approach decision making. Well, and that leads to my next point. You're a very cerebral person. You do a lot, a lot of thinking. So how do you think, how do you balance this as a player? Because I mean, how does that work for you? I mean, because you're a thinker, there's no question. Mm -hmm. uh, so how does that, how do you, how do you take that into your golf, you know, in the way you approach things? I, I just ask why a lot in, in golf. Um, and I won't stop until I get an answer that I'm, I'm satisfied with. The Callaway guys know this all too well. I'm uh, probably a bit of a pain, but I think a lot of the things I've uh, figured out with them have helped create better equipment. So one of the things a lot of equipment manufacturers do is they, uh, to get the swing weights the same on these irons, they'll put tip plugs in the base of the shaft in the hosel of the iron. And uh, Callaway sent me a set of blades. This was right when I was switching equipment. And I go, I can't feel the face. It feels like a hunk of metal on the end of a club. And I, I just, uh, 
I said, can we just take apart my old college irons? And we did. And there were six gram plugs in the hosels of the uh, Callaways and none or no more than two grams in the hosels of my college irons. And so they took all the weight out of the hosel, put it in lead tape on the back. That's why you'll see my irons still have lead tape in, on them on the back. And, uh, and uh, I, I could feel the face so much better all of a sudden. And so, you know, in the next set of Callaway irons, they have, you'll notice there's buttons, a little weight buttons on the back of the iron. And that's for that exact reason, so that we can keep the center of gravity the same on every iron and match the swing weights with, you know, little variances in in uh, one or two grams here and there with a, the, the production of the club. So uh, it, it's little things like that, that I think make me better, but I, I don't, I, I don't, you know, I really don't dive into numbers that much with TrackMan. People think I'm probably way really data driven. And I only use TrackMan for my distance combines, 20 random shots from different yardage buckets. Um, but I, I just like to ask the question why a lot, and uh, I try and answer that question in my journaling. That's great. Well, um, okay, before we, we have two things I wanna get done before we finish up here today. One is just give me an idea of what your schedule is gonna look like once you get started again in January. And then we're gonna do a speed round to finish up with, so. All right. Um, so I'll, just going off my schedule, I'm going to start at the American Express in Palm Springs. I'm going to skip Sony this year. It's just, I love playing in Palm Springs. It's the perfect way to start the year for me. I drive from Vegas to Palm Springs and then to Torrey and then back to Vegas. I'm going to skip Phoenix. And uh, the, the, it's three golf courses in Palm Springs. I get to stay at my parents' house and just go down four days early and practice. And, you know, there's usually some equipment testing to do the first event of the year as you're transitioning into the new stuff. And uh, the, the golf carts for the practice rounds and, and golf dome are the perfect place to do that. So I'll play American Express and Farmers at Torrey, Skip Phoenix. I'll play the AT&T in Riviera and get my fill of uh, Polana Greens, which I love as a West Coast guy. And then I'll have a week off and then I'm going to play Bay Hill players and Honda in Florida. That's our Florida swing. And after that, everything's kind of up in the air, depending on world ranking and uh, how I feel. And, and if I get into any WGCs or so uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But I know my first uh, first three months of the year are set and I can't wait for the West Coast. That's great. That's great. Well, uh, again, before we finish up here today, before we do the speed round, uh, Maverick, thank you so much for coming on today and just giving us a little, little insight into who you are, how you became what you've become. And uh, there's so much ahead of you. Uh, so I'm not not trying to put a, an ending to that. You've got a lot of years left. So uh, um, appreciate it. But uh, thank you for doing that. And I'm going to go ahead and start with the speed round right now, if, if you will. All right. All so right. Take as long as you need on these. But we try to do them fast. Okay, your favorite golf course you've played in your life? Prairie Dunes. Wow, I'm right there with you. I, I mean, literally <laughs> right there with you. That place is amazing. And I think number two is the is the most underrated short par three in the whole wide world. It's the greatest green complex I've ever been on. Yes, yes. Uh, the course you'd most like to play but haven't played? Uh, wow. Pine Valley. Very good. Favorite country music entertainer? Uh, Jason Aldean and Brantley Gilbert are the two that have their own playlists on my phone. Okay. And where's George Strait find a playlist? Does he have one or not? He's, he's the most concerts I've been to. Okay. <laughs> I've been to two of his concerts. I like hearing that. Okay. Among the, of the, among the four brothers, who's the most competitive? We, we all are. Um, it's a tie the for competitor workforce. in me is going to say it's me. <laughs> okay, all right. Best athlete. Just because, because I don't want them. To, I can't let them be more competitive than me. But That's why you're I'm the sure most competitive the guy. Exactly. Uh, best athlete of the four. Uh, Dakota was the best hockey player. Colty um, is the biggest. And uh, Scouty's always been, been a really, really good golfer. Okay. So the best hockey player, you've already answered that question for me. Yes, I was Dakota. Ask that Dakota. Dakota. But Colty, Colty had the best escape moves. He just did three or four too many. <laughs> <laughs> uh, favorite junk food, if, if any? Oreos. 
Oreos, nice. I love Oreos. All right, you have to choose. Remember the Titans or Shawshank Redemption? Shawshank. Great pick. Favorite tournament to win in the future, US what Open. you would like to win? U.S. Open. Okay. Now, your, your dream foursome, and it can be a fivesome, six people, seven. Mm -hmm. Pick the people you'd like to play with the most. If I had one round left in my life, it would be with my uh, five family members, mom, dad, Dakota, Colton, Scout, with our dog, Libby, tagging along. Okay, so Libby gets to go along. Of course, okay. yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, you know, that's one thing that impresses me about you. You're definitely a family guy. Love that. And before we finish, is there one thing I need to know about Scout before he comes back for second semester? Just one little tidbit that really helped me <laughs> that I could use against Scout. Oh man, he's gonna hate that I said this, but he is scared of fish. Okay. He hates fish. All right. I see. I see. Coach Miguel is smiling a little <laughs> bit over there. He's he's getting his gears turning. So, <laughs> if you want to stuff his locker with anything, fish. All right. Well, we'll upset uh, Scout for it. But again, Maverick, thank you so much for spending the time with us today, and and I hope you and your family have a great Christmas and a good start to the new year. You got it. Thanks, you guys too. Perfect.